This is the Unit 1 AP Macroeconomics Review. Before we get into the graphs of Unit 1, I wanted to cover a couple of topics that haven't popped up since Unit 1, so you may be a little bit rusty on them. The first two are the difference between macro and micro. Macro and micro both look at the economy, but macroeconomics looks at the entire United States as a whole. So it looks at things like GDP and unemployment and inflation and the government, as opposed to microeconomics looks at individual units. So like one producer, one firm, the market for one product versus macro is the market for the entire United States. The other two terms I wanted to go over is the difference between positive and normative economics. This is two ways of looking at a statement. A positive statement is just stating a fact, what is. So you are positive that this has happened or is currently happening. So if GDP has grown 3% this month, that is a positive statement. A normative statement is what ought to be. So normally this should happen is the way I like to think about it. So it's more of an opinion. So if the government lowers taxes, consumers should spend more money. Now I want to look at the first graph we learned in economics, the circular flow model. Now this is a graph you will not have to draw on the AP exam, but you do need to know how it works and it actually relates to most of the topics we covered throughout the whole semester. We have the product market. The product market deals with goods and services, and this is the one you're probably most familiar with because you go out and buy goods and services from firms all the time. So in the product market, the firm is the seller. They sell the goods and services to the households. And in return, we pay for those goods and services, which is revenue for the firm. The resource market deals with the four factors of production. These are four resources used to produce final products. They are land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. What's different about the resource market and can be a little tricky is that households are the sellers of resources versus in the product market, firms sell goods and services. So in the resource market, the firms are the sellers. They sell their resources, like when you go to work, you are selling your labor to the firm, and in return, firms pay their incomes. And here are the four types of incomes that you can earn for selling your resources. Labor collects wages, land collects rent, capital collects interest, and entrepreneurs collect profit. So RIP is a good way to keep in mind those four resource payments for the resources that we are selling. So this class will look at both markets, but predominantly the product market. The next graph we learned was the production possibilities curve. I have drawn the most common macro version of this curve with a bowed out line and also with capital and consumer goods on the axes. Now, the reason why this is a macro version of this graph because it looks at the all of the goods a country can produce, which is summarized by the two types of goods, capital and consumer goods. Capital goods are investment goods like education and technology. Consumer goods immediately satisfy your wants. So one of the biggest things with this graph is knowing that capital goods always lead to long run growth. Because by indirectly satisfying our wants today, it will lead to a greater payoff in the future. And that question comes up a lot, sacrificing current consumption for capital to achieve long run growth. The thing that pops up the most on this graph in terms of free response questions is how to correctly label an economy suffering from a recession, inflation, or at long run equilibrium. And I've illustrated that with these three points. So a point inside the line is an economy suffering from a recession or inefficiency. They have the resources, but they're not using it. The most common resource we're talking about is unemployment. They have the labor, but since they're not using it, unemployment exists. A point outside the line represents an economy that is trying to overuse the resources that they have. So we may see this as unattainable or more likely in macro inflation. Because if you try and overuse the resources that you don't have, it's going to end up creating inflation. And then the point along the line right here represents an economy in all those different ways of long run equilibrium that we covered. Full employment the natural rate of unemployment, at the potential GDP, when you're at the peak of the business cycle and you have no cyclical unemployment, all describe this scenario where you're making the best use of your resources. Now the micro term for this was efficiency, same idea, making the best use of your resources. But with micro, they broke it down a little bit beyond that. 
with two terms, allocative and productive efficiency. Productive efficiency describes any point along the line. It doesn't matter which combination you're choosing with your resources as long as you're efficiently using them. Allocative efficiency just describes one point, the exact middle point. Let's say B on this is the exact middle point. So this represents giving up an equal amount of each good or where the marginal benefits equal the marginal costs of each good. Now this in micro ends up being the best combination for the present for right now because you're giving up equal amounts of both when you're making a decision. But as I mentioned before, in macro, what we care about more is the long run growth. So although allocative may be the best combination for the present, if we're looking at this graph in terms of long run growth, what a firm or a country should do is shift their production towards capital goods. Because if they use their resources for capital goods, what will end up happening is the entire line will end up shifting out, which represents long run growth. So again, that focus on capital leads to long run growth. Also with this graph, I want to talk about why we have it on here as a bowed out curve as opposed to a straight line. You may see it as a straight line on the AP exam. That stands for the production possibilities frontier. And the production possibility frontier does exist, but it's not as accurate in most scenarios because the frontier shows that there's constant opportunity cost as you move along a straight line. And that only exists if a firm is using the same exact resources in the production of two goods. So in class, we use the example of a Mexican restaurant. Now, if they wanted to change from a taco to a burrito, they use almost the same exact resources to make both the goods. So as they move from producing one to the other, they have constant opportunity costs. But most times, countries and firms have what's known as increasing opportunity costs. And that's what the bowed out curve represents. This is saying that as firms go from producing one good to another, that there are more resources they have to give up because the resources are not perfectly adaptable at producing the different good they're switching to. So here's our basic supply and demand graph. And the first thing I wanted to go over with this graph are the things that move supply and demand, which are summarized by the two acronyms we learned, TRIPE for demand and GROWTH for supply. So with demand, the five components, TRIPE, is taste and preferences, which is just buying things that you prefer or in style or it's cold and they need a jacket. Related goods, which is talking about complements and substitutes. Complementary goods are goods that go together. So if the price of apples goes up, the demand for peanut butter goes down. Or substitutes are goods that compete with one another. So if the price of apples goes up, the demand for bananas increases because we're switching to bananas. Income deals with the types of goods we buy when our income changes. And the two types of goods we buy are normal and inferior goods. That can be a little tricky. Normal actually means luxury items. They're the items we want to buy more of as our income increases. So I think luxury when I hear the word normal. So my demand for normal goods increases when my income increases. Or if I get a pay cut, my demand for normal goods decreases. Inferior is just like it sounds. These are the goods off-brand, secondhand use that you would buy as your income falls and buy less of as your income rises. P is population, more people, more demand. And E is future expectations. You behave today based on the expected future price change. In growth, we have government, which in regular supply and demand, government moves the supply line first. So anything with taxes, regulations, subsidies, which is when the government gives the producer money. R is related goods. Now this is the one you'll see the most often and a lot of things fit under this. We have wars, wages, natural disasters, oil, steel, and lumber are the six common resources. And these will be the same six resources in the aggregate model that we learn later. So keep in mind that resources is the most common and look for those keywords I just listed. O is other good. You sell the good that makes you the most profit. T is technology. Technology always helps the producer. E is expectation again, but from the producer's perspective. And S is size of market. This deals with the number of producers. So if employees get hired, there's more producers making the product, the supply increases. So with this, we, let's say, have an increase in the wages in this market. And I want to show this on the graph. So if there's an increase in wages, I have to think, does this fit in a tripe or gross? And then I'm like, okay, 
it fits into growth's resource costs. And if wages increase, if I'm thinking of that as a resource cost for the producer, I would say the producer has less money, so the supply would decrease or move to the left. And I'll show you that right here. If supply decreases and moves to the left, then we notice we have a new equilibrium by equilibrium where the supply and demand line intersect. And what happens when we have a new equilibrium is that creates a new equilibrium price and a new equilibrium quantity. So here we would see that equilibrium price goes up, moving from here to here, and equilibrium quantity falls, moving from there to there. So that's how I'd show an equilibrium problem on a supply and demand graph. But the last thing I want to cover is what about price changes? Because they have a very significant role on this graph, but maybe not the role you were thinking. Price changes go into this idea that repeats a lot and comes into the play in the aggregate model. Price does not affect behavior. Price only changes the quantity that either a producer sells, quantity supplied, or a consumer buys, quantity demanded. So one thing to always keep in mind, Price does not change supply, price does not change demand, it only changes the quantity. So if you ever ask which of the following does not change demand, a lot of times the answer is a change in price of a product. So what happens with price is if it doesn't change demand, it just changes the quantity, it ends up moving along the supply or the demand line. Let's look at this with the price increase. So if the prices of a good were to go up, you would move up along the line for demand, to show that the quantity that the consumers want to buy decreases. We buy a lower quantity at a higher price. This is also known as the law of demand, the inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. And there were three things that described that. The income effect, where if prices are higher, my income buys a lower quantity. Substitution effect, where if prices of a good are higher, I'm going to switch to another good, a substitute, so my quantity falls. And diminishing marginal utility. This is decreasing satisfaction with each additional unit. This is that idea of I'm only willing to buy a large quantity of something if the price is low, because I know I'm never going to be as satisfied with the fifth, the sixth, the seventh of a good as I was with the first. So that is describing that movement along the line. Now with supply, it's upward sloping to show the law of supply that at a higher price, the producers want to sell a larger quantity, which I show by a movement up along the line which producers want to sell as much as they can at the highest price possible. That's just basic supply. So what happens if consumers don't want to buy it, but producers do want to sell it, is it ends up creating this disequilibrium scenario called a surplus. Above equilibrium, so it's not where we want to be, the price is too high because quantity supply is greater than quantity demanded. The opposite would be a price decrease. If prices were to decrease, again, we'd move down along the line, but now to show that consumers want to buy a larger quantity because the price is low, diminishing marginal utility. I'm only willing to buy a large quantity if the price is super low. But now producers don't want to sell as much quantity at that lower price, so quantity supply falls. So here we have the quantity demanded is higher than the quantity supply, which is why a price decrease always creates a shortage. So price problems create shortages and surpluses instead of changes in equilibrium because it only changes the quantity, not the behavior. One additional thing with that, sometimes the government can create a shortage or a surplus by doing what's known as artificial price controls. So these are government set minimums and maximum prices that end up creating disequilibrium. So what we see here is if the government were to set a price floor, and this would be to help the producers, a producer can't exist at equilibrium price, so the government's like, I will set a minimum price for you so you are able to stay in business. This price floor is graphed above equilibrium because they cannot go below it. This is the minimum price that the producers now can charge which sounds great for the producers until you see on the graph if the price is above equilibrium, if that's the minimum, it's always going to end up creating a surplus because it's going to have that scenario where quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded. The opposite scenario is when the government does a price ceiling. This is a maximum price. So now this is to help the consumers. Help the consumers who can't survive at equilibrium price, it's too high for them to be able to afford it. So you might see this in something that consumers need, but the price is too high for them to afford it normally. So this price is set below equilibrium. 
So the ceiling is below. And that represents the max that cannot go above this price. That's why it always is below equilibrium. So with that, if the price is low, now the producers don't want to sell as much quantity, but the consumers want to buy more. So because the quantity demanded is now larger than the quantity supplied, a price ceiling will always create a shortage. So these are seen as inefficient because they move the economy off of equilibrium and create those disequilibriums of shortages and surplus. And that is the end of the Unit 1 AP Macroeconomics Review.